Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic with true transcripts of Class Action 12711 VCS provided by Plainsight.org. It's time for the witness you've all been waiting for. Kimball the Cook showed up for the afternoon of day two to show the court how clever he is and how business savvy he's become over the years as a professional coattail rider. It's important to recognize that Kimball Musk was also a named defendant in this class action, but he and all the other defendants except for Musk settled out of court by agreeing to pay a combined $60 million in penalties, a sum that was covered by a special insurance policy called D&O, or Directors and Officers Liability Insurance. That policy at Tesla has since been canceled, even though all those same board members are named defendants in many upcoming trials and actions. For those trials, they will be relying on Elon Musk to pay their legal bills on their behalf, which is problematic because the DNO insurance was meant to protect and separate those directors from Elon Musk, allowing them to maintain their objectivity and independence. Kimball Musk takes the stand opposite lawyers for the defense. Daniel Slifkin from Kravis, Swain & Moore has been tasked with the unenviable chore of direct examination of Kimball, who is Musk's younger brother. Despite having absolutely no experience with cars nor rockets, Kimball Musk rode his brother's coattails right into board seats at both Tesla and SpaceX. The two brothers have actually been in cahoots since Elon dropped out of Stanford to start up Zip2 with Kimball. This happened in 1995 when Musk was 25 and Kimball was 23. Kimball says he and his brother were co-founders of the company, giving no mention whatsoever to the third founder, 34-year-old real estate developer Greg Curry, who was the person attracting venture capitalists to this project after being introduced through the boy's father, Errol. Without Curry and his connections, these two siblings would never have attracted any venture capital to Zip2. When Kimball tells the court that Compaq bought Zip2 for $300 million, he makes it sound as if it was something just he and his brother put together and sold. But this is far from the truth. The deal was put together by Derek Proudian, who replaced Rich Sarkeen as CEO, who was the one who took over from Musk because the VCs insisted that Musk be removed. Kimball's older brother made the same type of admissions during his direct examination as well, and barely mentioned Kimball in this enterprise at all. Not only did Kimball omit most of that story, he lies outright on the stand about what Zip2 was. He declares that, quote, we built essentially what became Yahoo Maps, Google Maps, back in the 90s. There is no remnant of code from Zip2, acquired by Compaq in 1999, that ever existed in Yahoo Maps nor Google Maps. In fact, the maps that Zip2 used were provided to them for free by Navtech, which is still around providing maps for vehicle navigation. And the business directory they used in the beginning was another third-party property. All Zip2 did was try to combine those databases. To further clarify, Yahoo was started by Jerry Yang and David Philo in 1994 at Stanford University as a website called Jerry and David's Guide to the World Wide Web. By 2002, the renamed Yahoo had blown up to the point where Google wanted Yahoo to buy them out for $5 billion. Yahoo didn't want to pay more than $3 billion, so that deal fell through and Google went on to become the online behemoth it is today, including the release of Google Maps, which first came online February 8th of 2005. So not even two full pages of testimony into these proceedings, and Kimball has committed perjury several times over to make himself sound far more clever than he is. This, it seems, will be a recurring theme today. Slifkin lies for his client when he asks Kimball to confirm that Musk's X.com went on to become PayPal. By now, we all know that's not what happened at all that the PayPal code was created by Confinity long before the merger with X.com, and Musk's seven-month stint with the company included neither the creation of the program in the beginning nor the successful sale to eBay at the end. So the lawyer really should have known better than to ask that question that way, since it was false and misleading, and required his own witness to commit perjury again. After Kimball made $15 million from the dot-com boom and bust thanks to the poor decision made by Compaq, Kimball moved to New York to study cooking. He took his education and the money he made to found The Kitchen, which he claims is one of the founders of the farm-to-table movement in America. Missed it by over 30 years. One of the first farm-to-table restaurants to open in the U.S. was Chez Panisse in Berkeley, California in 1971. Kimball's The Kitchen had nothing to do with starting that movement. Also, The Kitchen has seen its share of bad press lately, in no small part because the company has closed most of its locations at the outset of COVID and Kimball held tight to an emergency fund that staff paid into from their every paycheck, which was meant for exactly that type of hardship scenario, but Kimball had refused to release those funds to the people who needed them, preferring to fire those people instead. 
Kimball tries telling the court that his 16-restaurant chain had a value of $100 million before COVID, although it seems the franchise is now closing locations. On their website, the kitchen appears to be active in only three locations presently, Boulder and Denver and Colorado, and a single outlet in Chicago. Kimball also had a stint as CEO with a marketing company called One Riot that was sold to Walmart, and he co-founded a nonprofit called Big Green that teaches kids how to garden in outdoor classrooms. Or at least it did, until the staff tried unionizing and Kimball fired them all. Not sure how successful this has been of late, and their website hasn't been updated for at least three years since it still lists Kimball as on the board of Chipotle. From 2013 to 18, Chipotle had Kimball on their board, which was probably just a paycheck for him since he was supposed to be working at his own restaurants at the time. No conflict of interest there. He also tells the court that he is on the board of Burning Man, but if that was true in July of 2021, it no longer seems to be the case. His name does not appear on their website, and a Google search of Kimball Musk Burning Man doesn't show any involvement from Kimball other than attending it. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. 2004 was when Musk convinced Kimball to join him on the board at Tesla when Musk started stacking the board with sycophants in an early preparation for the coup that Musk would conduct against Martin Eberhardt, the actual visionary behind the Tesla Roadster. The lawyer starts asking Kimball a bunch of questions that Kimball cannot possibly know the answers to, relating to his brother's actions and behaviors, yet he answers all of them in the negative anyway. And the answers he gives regarding forcing directors out and mistreatment of his peers flies in the face of known facts regarding Musk's treatment of Martin Eberhardt. On page 444 of the transcripts, the lawyer asks Kimball about his compensation as a Tesla director, keeping in mind that Kimball, although he sits on the board, has no other role in the company and does not even participate in any committees or special committees. Which is one of the reasons why, in 2021, shareholders again attempted to vote Kimball out of the company for his habit of simply taking up space. They also tried to accomplish this three years earlier, to no avail. In return for his minimal amount of effort, Kimball Musk receives 50,000 stock options every three years, and a stipend of $5,000 per quarter or $20,000 per year. Both of these are mentioned as if they are chump change. Sure, the 20 grand a year, no big deal. But the 200,000 stock options that he would have racked up by the time Tesla bailed Musk out of Solar City would have been worth $37 million on November 21, 2016, when the transaction closed at $37.01 with the 5 to 1 split considered, and would have been worth $250 million at their recent all time high. Since 2016, he would have received another 100,000 stock options worth another $120 million for occupying a chair on his big brother's board at his request, initially to participate in the ouster of the original founders of the company. At this point, the lawyer tries to establish that Kimball is independently wealthy and not reliant upon these handouts from Musk or Tesla. Given Kimball's very shaky business acumen, this is likely going to backfire during cross-examination. Kimball is asked about the original long-term strategy of Tesla, and Kimball starts speaking about the company like he was there when Martin Eberhardt was daydreaming about the Porsches. He describes a feigned frustration in 2004 with the auto industry for failing to bring an electric car to market. Luckily for him, Eberhardt, Tarpenning, and Ian Wright had already been working on Eberhardt's vision for a year before even meeting this wannabe cowboy. The lawyer leads his witness into agreeing that in 2004, when Kimball first came on board at Tesla, that there was some vision to the future for energy storage as part of the company. And we already know that Kimball's answer in the affirmative is not truthful, because Musk's published Master Plan Part 1 on the Tesla website made no mention of storage whatsoever. The word storage is nowhere on the page, neither is the term Powerwall. And the only batteries mentioned in this document are the ones in the cars. However, Kimball states this was why Tesla built the Powerwall, which he describes as a very, very successful product. The Powerwalls are made in the Nevada Gigafactory, and that complex is staffed and run by Panasonic. You can even apply for jobs in Sparks, Nevada right now on the Panasonic website. He goes on to say that he and his brother had been talking for years about Tesla buying a solar division, but the board would not accept the idea. Slifkin then asks Kimball who formed Solar City, and Kimball messes up again. He says Elon Musk, Lyndon Rive, and Peter Rive. Musk contributed funds and again bought the chairman of the board seat, but he was not a founder. Only the two Rive brothers are on the original documents. After the lawyer prompts him, Kimball tells the court that in 2006, he and his brother were trying very hard to convince the board at Tesla to have Solar City become part of the company. 
This is something that his brother failed to mention from the stand, and when prompted during his cross-examination, Musk was unable to provide meeting minutes from any board meeting that included recorded conversations in this regard. Instead, as Kimball states, Solar City was dealt with at arm's length like any other solar installer, where Tesla would sell them the power walls made in Nevada for connection to installed solar arrays. Slifkin brings up JX2382, a photograph of the Nevada Gigafactory where Tesla branded cells and battery packs are manufactured. This includes the Mega Pack, which Kimball mistakenly refers to as a 1 megawatt hour pack. It's actually a 3 megawatt hour pack. For the next bit, Kimball and his lawyer have a conversation about board meetings and discussions that Kimball claims they had that weren't recorded in the minutes. It goes on for a while, and you can read them for yourself if you like. We'll move forward to the presentation of JX855 on page 460. This is the Project Icarus proposal that Musk cooked up the weekend before with Lyndon Rive while not vacationing in Lake Tahoe before co-opting Todd Mayer and Jason Wheeler and his team to slap together a presentation with no other input from any board member, as someone who is fully recused would obviously do. Gimbel states that the Icarus presentation used a price of $63 per share for Solar City. Without that document in hand, it's hard to see what that is in reference to. However, Solar City had not traded regularly at that level since the summer of 2015. In 2016, it fell from around $50 to the mid-teens, and spent the whole year bouncing off a floor around $16 before ending on the final day at $20.34. Gimbel acknowledges the price at that time was in the 20s, and the board dismissed the prospect of buying Solar City at that time, wanting Musk to instead focus on fixing production issues with the Model X. From the end of May 2016, JX1131 is brought out, board meeting minutes again, talking about Solar City despite the previous meeting's conclusions. This is where the board suddenly changed their mind about acquiring, quote, a solar energy company, end quote, and Kimball tries to tell the court they were going to consider multiple targets, something not even Musk had claimed in his deposition or in his testimony. On page 464, Kimball is asked about Wachtell Lipton's association with Tesla. This longtime board member couldn't say for sure if this legal counsel had worked for Tesla previously, despite their long-standing relationship. He also states that one of the board members took the lead on engaging Wachtell for this transaction. He doesn't know who it was, but he says he knows it wasn't Elon. It was Elon. Elon said as much the day before. He and Gracias had handpicked that team. The board then engaged independent financial advisors from Evercore, another firm that Kimball had worked with previously. George Bilicek's earlier testimony is that he was very glad that his firm, Lazard, was not called upon to represent that side of the table. Kimball is then asked whether or not Musk recused himself from these dealings. Kimball said he did, although from the previous testimony from Musk, it's pretty obvious he did not. Kimball is also asked about whether or not Antonio Gracias recused himself from the process, and Kimball says yes, except we already know that's not true either. As a board member at both Solar City and Tesla, Gracias was involved in the discussions regarding share ratios and assisted in the selection of law firms. Those actions are direct violations of a recusal, but Kimball seems to be unaware of any behind-the-scenes action and possibly what the word recusal means. When asked who is to lead the process, Kimball mentions Robin Denholm, who of course is now the chair at Tesla. And when asked what his personal role in the transaction was, Kimball says he fancies himself a good negotiator that stayed involved so he could get a better price for Solar City on behalf of the Tesla shareholders. As a Musk plant and sibling, Kimball did not recuse himself from the votes, and he acknowledges that he is not a Nasdaq independent director at Tesla. While Kimball did not hold a board position at Solar City, he did have millions of dollars invested in that company. Meaning, any negotiating he would have done to get Solar City at a better price on behalf of the Tesla shareholders would have taken money directly out of his pocket. So you have a director on the board of Tesla who thinks he's a shrewd negotiator who despite the family connections did not recuse himself from the dealings with millions tied up in the target of acquisition. He is also, get this, on the board of SpaceX where he has even more millions of dollars in investment tied up and that company was buying Solar City bonds that were threatened with being worthless if Solar City went under. The pseudo cowboy seems to be completely oblivious as to how conflicted he is here, despite claiming otherwise. He's an investor in all three entangled companies in this mess, a director for two of them thanks to his brother. Oh, and he's the younger brother to the person who is leading this charge. As a board member at SpaceX, Kimball says he was only aware to a small degree of SpaceX's investment in solar bonds. 
As a director, he should have been keenly aware the company had spent a quarter billion dollars on those pieces of paper using money that was supposed to be going towards the development of Crew Dragon, which was lagging behind schedule already at that point. Gimbel says it was never suggested to him that Solar City would not be able to repay those bonds. But given Musk's testimony, it's pretty obvious that everybody involved with SpaceX knew they were in jeopardy with the constant rollovers on those bonds. We'll see if anybody on the plaintiff side picks up on any of this during Cross. Evercore's findings on behalf of the Tesla board come up as Exhibit JX1231. On page 9, Slifkin turns Kimball's attention to the header, Solar City, the clear market leader. A graph compares Solar City against competitors such as Vivint, Sunrun, and SunPower, but it does not identify or investigate the other companies as potential targets. All of the focus is on Solar City. Just so we are all on the same page here, that was the graph in 2016. This is the graph today. Completely different story. According to Kimball's limited knowledge, the company had a great market share. Sure, they were growing well. Well, not really. Guidance for fiscal 2016 megawatts installed at Solar City were being dropped from the previously announced 1,250 megawatts to 1,100, according to the company's own updated release to its shareholders. The actual forecast was not 1,100, it was only 900, and in reality, it only clocked in at 846, leaving a shortfall of 404 megawatts compared to the previous guidance. So they weren't growing anywhere near their forecast. Evercore obviously didn't include this in their presentation or the information was ignored, and their recommendation to pursue only Solar City was agreed to. Kimball states that Solar City shares had gone to almost $100. Again, no, that's quite the embellishment and an old one at that. Solar City hit a one time, very temporary all time high of $88.35 in February of 2014, then never saw those levels again. From there, the stock bled out until the day it was bailed out by Tesla. Now, after letting Kimball pump up the company, Slipkin asked Kimball about the guidance drop between the fourth quarter of 2015 and the first quarter of 2016. As the friendly lawyer to this witness, he really should not have done that, personal opinion, because it shows how little Kimball understands what he's shown. He looked at that information and found it extremely exciting, very rosy, and they can't grow fast enough, after being shown that the company was losing ground and demonstrating negative growth. Now we're at June 20th of 2016. Minutes from another board meeting are labeled JX1228, where the discussion of price ratio is brought up by the board. Although Musk and Gracias were not in the room for this vote, they were in attendance for the previous discussions, guiding the process, as was documented by the Evercore team. And at this point of the trial, the master negotiator admits he doesn't even know how exchange ratios on mergers and acquisitions are derived. If you don't know that entry-level business valuation parameter, how the hell are you expecting to conduct negotiations on behalf of the Tesla shareholders? So the lawyer quickly takes the frame down to avoid confusing this witness any further. But his confusion continues anyway. Gimbel says the reason why Tesla went public with her offer to acquire Solar City was to keep the price low and lock in the price. Number one, that is not what happened. After the deal was announced, the share price at Solar City jumped. And number two, the reason why they went public with the announcement was because Musk and his corrupted cohorts had already written the damn press release before the meeting was held. Kimball seems to think that making the offer public knowledge somehow limits the option of the acquisition target. That Tesla had intentionally restricted SolarCity's ability to function normally up until the bailout was finalized. That was not Musk's testimony at all. According to Musk, SolarCity continued to be able to access capital markets anytime they wanted. He stated this repeatedly. So one of the brothers here is definitely lying. Fast forward to July when Evercore and Bilicek were grinding out the numbers and Kimball says there was some discussion about lowering their offer price based on information about SolarCity that came to light. Again, Kimball was under a false impression that in July of 2016, SolarCity had significant cash deposits. In fact, at this point in time, his cousin Lyndon Rive was freaking out at Musk because they had no operating capital and were having to defer payments to their vendors to keep any cash at all in reserve. And then, Kimball tells the court there was never any discussion at the board level of SolarCity being insolvent. No discussion about it being a going concern. Or that it might be going out of business or have to declare bankruptcy, as the forensic accountants have already testified was indeed the case. The topic of bridge financing comes up, which is where Musk was asking Tesla to give SolarCity a hand staying in business while this bailout got sorted out. Kimball says he remembers that conversation, yet he still thought SolarCity was sitting on big piles of cash. Those two scenarios contradict each other in a big way. 
But Kimball says he was against providing the bridge because that allowed Tesla to maintain leverage over his own cousin's company. A company that Evercore told the board in July was overvalued compared to the initial offer and that it had, quote, near-term liquidity needs and the risk of a default under certain of its material financing arrangements, end quote. Kimball says he didn't find that incredibly important information significant. A new share ratio was determined by people who knew what that term meant, and it was put to a shareholder vote in November. Starting on page 485, Slifkin asked Kimball if the bailout made sense to him, and of course Kimball says yes, because they had been telling the world that Tesla was already an alternative energy company, except they never were, and neither were Solar City. Solar City was a solar installer, not a solar manufacturer, so they offered no innovation to the space. Kimball is under the impression that solar will become the biggest industry in the world, much larger than the car industry. It's fair to say that not many people would share that opinion that solar will be the largest industry in the world. Certainly by revenue, solar is still a small speck in the overall picture. The claim that it is bigger than the car industry is laughable, and even if this misconception were completely true, what is Tesla Energy's excuse for continuing to lose market share in this giant industry? Because that's what's at the heart of this trial, isn't it? Solar City was supposed to be the biggest player in the space and has since been reduced to ashes and a two-star rating since the bailout. Kimball says on page 486 that they followed Solar City very closely for a long time. In fact, Kimball was a multi-million dollar investor, remember. But this master negotiator ignored things like diminishing guidance and issues of liquidity in his final analysis of the value of the company. Kid Cowboy thinks that adding Solar City to Tesla has been fantastic and has brought great value to the company. In truth, the energy generation division has shriveled since 2017, its glory days well behind it. In what can only be called a foolish move by anyone who has looked at the numbers, Slifkin brings up a live link to the Tesla website, where he is unable to distinguish between a solar roof and a solar tile while asking Kimball questions. This is done to demonstrate that Tesla still sells solar products, which they do, but they do not make the products, and they don't sell very many of them, while enjoying one of the worst reputations among major brands in the solar space. Slifkin points out that on the website, Tesla advertises the lowest cost solar panels in America. Again, even if true, they are not panels made by Tesla, nor the remnants of Solar City. So either these panels are cheaper to buy than other companies, and or they are being sold at a lesser margin than other companies. Either way, this does not represent a market advantage for the company. Slifkin notes on the webpage the white power walls and asks Kimball if it is possible to buy a power wall without buying a solar roof. Kimball lies, knowingly or otherwise, and says the unit cannot be purchased independently. It absolutely can. In fact, not only can you buy a power wall built by Panasonic in Nevada to use as a backup to normal grid failures, you can buy them through Tesla competitors such as Sunrun, right there on their website. Call for a quote. On page 490, Slifkin asks Kimball if Musk dismantled Solar City. Kimball says no. Musk himself said yes. Every resource, including human resources, were put towards the Model 3 rollout. Slifkin asks Kimball if Tesla continues to sell products derived from Solar City, but Solar City never made products. Even the solar roof tiles that occasionally get sold by Tesla are not made by any Musk company. They come from China. And they look nothing like the tiles that were shown to shareholders in the fall of 2016 to swing their vote in favor of this bailout. Slifkin goes into his home stretch of his direct examination asking Kimball how he would describe Tesla, and Kimball waxes poetic about how Tesla aims to accelerate the world to an alternative energy future. It is almost cultish how often this is repeated by Kimball and his brother, and it's not really based in reality at all. If it were true, if that were their focus, Musk would not have gutted Solar City after Tesla bailed him out and put lawyers and accountants from Solar City on the Model 3 assembly line. He would not have allowed the company to drop to a shadow of its former self. Even today, five years later, the energy division manages to install a fraction of the solar panels it used to, doesn't make its own products, and has a pathetic industry reputation. Oh, and it's losing a bunch of money again. Yet Kimball is fully aware the current valuation of the company is propped up on the illusion that Tesla is an innovative solar energy company. The quote from Kimball, once we were able to convince the market that we were an energy company, they started to value us as such, and we are considerably more valuable. Convincing people of something versus delivering on that expectation, however, seem to be completely different ends of the spectrum for Tesla. Okay, that was our real-time dismantling of the Cowboy Clown Direct Examination. Let's see what happens when a pro takes Kimball the Cook to task, 
and the attorney selected for this task is Lee Rudy of Kessler, Topaz, Meltzer, and Czech. Lee Rudy graduated with his BA cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania in 1992, then from Fordham University School of Law with his JD in 1996. He served for several years as the Assistant District Attorney in the Manhattan DA's office and Assistant United States Attorney in the U.S. Attorney's office, where he tried dozens of jury cases to verdict. In the Delaware court system, he was co-lead trial counsel in the landmark case in Southern Peru's Copper Corporation shareholder derivative litigation in 2011, a $2 billion trial verdict against Southern Peru's majority shareholder, and in Facebook Inc. Class C reclassification litigation, which forced Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg to abandon plans to issue a new class of non-voting shares to entrench Zuckerberg as the company's majority stockholder. Those are just two examples of dozens of high-profile actions he's participated in. He holds awards of recognition in 2020 and 2021 from Benchmark Litigation Stars and the Law Dragon 500 leading plaintiff financial lawyer since 2019. After introducing himself to the witness, Rudy wastes no time with niceties on Kimball. He gets right to the first point, which is that Kimball's 147,541 shares in Solar City at the time of the transaction were actually pledged as collateral for personal loans that Kimball had taken out, and these loans were subject to margin calls. Starting in 2015, those margin loans got called several times when Solar City share prices dropped, requiring Kimball to come up with cash to cover the margin, which he raised by either selling shares in Tesla or SpaceX. So within one page of questioning, Rudy has already shown that Kimball's investments were not nearly as secured or stable, nor cut and dried as Slifkin tried to portray in the direct examination. Each time the margin loan got called, Kimball had to liquidate portions of his holdings, and the historical graph of Solar City share price shows a pretty steady decline from the all-time high in 2014 until November of 2016. Rudy goes to a specific example following the Solar City third quarter earnings release on October 29th of 2015. Share price fell below $30.80, which put Kimball in a call position. For several pages, Kimball gives the lawyer some hassle about Rudy announcing to the court that his margins were being called, and he dances around the topic. But one way or another, Kimball had to juggle money around to avoid repercussions. This happened again in November of 2015 with another share price decline, and Kimball needed to bounce between margins he had on his Tesla shares, which maxed out at around 25% of their value, and the margin loans against his Solar City shares, which were in the neighborhood of around 60%, as he recalls. For those of you that need this in layman's terms, this is pretty much the same as paying off your visa by using your American Express, or by pawning your mom's silver. At the bottom of page 498, Rudy brings up JX556, an email from November 9th of 2015, where Kimball had to authorize a $332,000 release from his Tesla margin to cover his Solar City margin. And the next day, Kimball asked his brother for a $10 million loan. Kimball says it was because he needed to conduct a financing round at his restaurant chain, and he wanted to lead the round, wanted to be the big shot. Meanwhile, he's bouncing money back and forth between credit lines secured by a declining stock. Kimball starts getting his details mixed up, so Rudy refers to Kimball's deposition on the same topic. Kimball wanted Musk to personally loan him $10 million, collateralized by Kimball's remaining shares in SpaceX. At the bottom of page 500, Rudy needs to clarify Kimball's previous statement that he is financially independent of his brother. That was his testimony under direct examination. Yet he had no issues asking his brother for $10 million days after his margin loans were getting called, under the apparent pretense of leading a funding round at his own company. At the end of the day, Musk didn't give him the money, not even the $2.5 million he had agreed to previously. So Kimball had to scramble and sell shares in SpaceX to get liquid in December of 2015 to cover his debt. Now, previously on page 500, Kimball made a point of telling the court that you don't just ask Elon Musk for $10 million by email. But on page 502, Rudy brings up JX590, where that is exactly what he did. Rudy asks him, isn't that exactly what you're doing here? And Clueless Cowboy answers, no. So Rudy reads the email verbatim. Hey man, if I wanted to put more money into the kitchen, can I increase how much I loan against SpaceX? Right now you're good with 2.5 million, would you be good with 5 million or 10 million? My reasoning is that I'm going to be building this company forever and can get us into a really good cash flow with around 10 million dollars investment. Don't love the idea of giving up a bunch of my company if I can avoid it. No worries if 2.5 million is where you're comfortable but wanted to check in in case a larger number was available. I have 25 million in SpaceX stock. So yep, that's exactly what he was doing, despite Kimball's excuses otherwise. 
Rudy goes into the details about what this money was for. The kitchen, as it turns out, under Kimball as CEO, if you can believe that, had to do a private financing round. As a 45% shareholder, Kimball was telling the other shareholders that he was planning on investing $2.5 million in the round. So Rudy is a little confused why Kimball would tell his own investors $2.5 million and then ask his brother for $10 million when Musk had previously apparently agreed to the $2.5 million that Kimball needed to make good on his boasting to the other shareholders at the kitchen. All of a sudden it's pretty obvious that Kimball the cook is no financial whiz and he must be pretty thankful that his brother got on those pity posts on company boards and industries he knows nothing about. However, it's pretty much guaranteed those favors and paychecks came with strings. Rudy calls up JX521. This is an email chain between Kimball and his cousin Lyndon Rive, CEO at Solar City. Kimball was hitting up all the other family members to finance the round because he knew he was going to come up short. Lyndon, who already had money in the kitchen, told him, would love to, but cash strapped. Margin calls are getting close and need to sell a little SpaceX to get some cash. Solar City is seeing its ass and need to get it turned around. This is direct communication to Kimball informing him that Solar City is in trouble and Kimball replies, I'm with you, been watching. End of the day when it came time to pony up for his shareholders in the kitchen, Kimball could only scrape together a million and a half instead of the promised 2.5. And at the same time, the sales price at Solar City continued to drop. Rudy continues to February 8, 2016, when a Ms. Winkleman, who is called Kimball's personal CFO, informed Kimball that he was looking at another call due to an ugly morning market. And Kimball replies, from the conversations I'm hearing, this is going to last at least a year and possibly through 2017. JX763, another bad news email from Winkleman. This time the call is for, quote, probably a million. To put a face to the name, this is Karen Winkleman. She was described as Kimball Musk's personal CFO. She is now the CEO of InnoVest Family Office, a six-person financial firm in Greenwood Village, Colorado, specializing in financial planning for the wealthy. She and her firm have no declared connection to Kimball Musk today. In fact, this trial is the only place where this association can be found online. It's almost as if when this was said and done, she wanted nothing to do with him. A couple weeks after these emails, Musk called a special meeting at Tesla on February 29th to talk about acquiring Solar City, as we went through before, a meeting Kimball would have attended. Kimball says nobody told him that Solar City was struggling with cash. Nobody told him that Solar City had only two options, either raise cash or sell the company. Yet he just told his personal CFO in this earlier email chain that he already knew Solar City was in for a pasting for the next two years. Rudy has to bring Kimball back to earth after a bit of a monologue to ask him again about the March 29, 2016 minutes, where it states following a number of discussions by the board in regards to acquiring Solar City, but there is no record of these discussions taking place, especially in the March 3, 2015 meeting that is specifically mentioned. Those conversations were not recorded in 2015, so the entry in the 2016 minutes is false, as JX306 clearly demonstrates. There is no mention prior to 2016 of acquiring a $2 billion public company. There's no documents, no presentations, no banker workup, nothing. Rudy goes into another angle, and that is, since Elon Musk was chairman of both boards, if there was a long-standing plan in the works for Solar City to eventually be bought out by Tesla, he should know about it, and so should both boards. But Kimball tells the court that Solar City had no clue, and if they did, he was not a part of that process. So this long-standing plan that Kimball is claiming to have been in place for a decade, according to Kimball, has never been mentioned before to his two cousins that founded the solar company. As he said, they had no clue. Obviously, if that had been the plan all along, they would have known about it. We're going to split the episode here, roughly in the middle of Kimball's time on the stand. And in the second half, we're going to go straight through until Lee Rudy is done with Kimball the cook. Rudy is just getting started with this witness. So we are in recess.